the opposition speaking now? Do we do we know what he's been saying? Because I mean, one of his um, sort of often used criticisms of Scholz is that it's just too little, too late, isn't it? I mean, what's he focusing on? Well, yeah, the opposition party, the CDU, the Conservatives, are the biggest opposition in this current Bundestag. And, of course, they were in power for 16 years under Angela Merkel. We all remember that. And uh, the government of Olaf Scholz has often criticised uh, the Angela Merkel government for not doing enough, essentially. But Friedrich Merz is saying that this current government doesn't understand, uh, understand markets. They don't understand the economy. He also just now in his speech said that... Uh, there were hasty decisions that had to be ruled back, so it seems like it's a chaotic government. And um, he also said, for example, that there is no clear strategy when it comes to the defence policy of Germany, of the current government. He said Olaf Scholz has promised that uh, Germany will spend 2% of its budget on defence, but the current budget doesn't say that. He says, uh, Friedrich Merz, the opposition leader, says that uh, on the contrast, Germany is um, spending 300 million less than it was uh, spending before. So this is something where possibly we might see an angry chancellor reacting to Friedrich Merz. That's at least something that happened at the last general debate about uh, uh, here in the Bundestag, where an usually calm chancellor, Olaf Scholz, reacted with very strong words, almost with an outbreak of rage after he spoke, when, when he spoke after Friedrich yeah, you said that he uh, is usually very calm. I mean, he always, Chancellor Scholz always tries to come across as very calm, very measured, giving the impression that things under control are under control. And yet there's really been a time when there have been so many crises to deal with. Would you say that people in Germany feel reassured that his government is doing a good job? Well, not if you believe the polls, but then polls are not something that Olaf Scholz goes by traditionally. He says, I'm doing my job, I'm working hard behind the scenes, and then I'm going to present results. And what he has achieved is he has managed to get the support from the opposition, uh, also from Friedrich Merz, for some of his bigger projects, like that special budget for the military, for example, um, where they had to change um, our, uh, our constitution, essentially, is to allow for that to happen. Also so there's another thing about how to help poorer families. They've just now reached a compromise also with the opposition party. So Olaf Scholz is somebody who works behind the scenes and then brokers compromises behind the scenes. And he's not just having to deal with the opposition. He's also the leader of the very first three-way party coalition government. So the Liberal, FDP, the Greens and his own Social Democrats. That is a tricky job in itself. And many people are saying in light of all the multiple crises that Germany is facing right now because of Russia's invasion and because of the former uh, dependence on Russia, especially when it comes to energy supplies, it is quite remarkable that this government is still going and that it is presenting results to the population that also come in the form of cash in people's pockets. The, the um, German government will be um, uh, presenting its budget for the, for the next uh, year in a couple of days. What do we know about the, the priorities that the government will be setting uh, in, the, in the coming 12 months? Well, a lot of it is obviously going to go into um, trying to get through this winter, into trying to make the system work despite all the challenges that Germany is facing. So there is going to be a lot of um, focus on just how to increase our energy sovereignty, on, on resilience. And um, this is something where Germany is having to do a lot of homework because the previous governments didn't really look for alternatives. So that is definitely one of the big priorities. But obviously the issue, what the core objective and the mission of the German army is, is also something that is going to be debated. We heard about the announced withdrawal from Mali by May 2024. So there is a big debate here. We are very close to Russia here in Berlin, in Germany as a whole. Uh, what job does the Bundeswehr, the military force, Forces actually have to fulfill should they invest more in the Bundeswehr at home or uh, is the Bundeswehr, the military forces, are the armed forces needed abroad more? So that is
that is going to be one of the key debates um, that mm. are probably going to keep us busy all through next year as well. If we could just talk about Ukraine briefly, I mean, we know that more money will be sent to Ukraine. And people here in Berlin, especially, are feeling the effects of that war with the number of, of refugees uh, that have already come and that will probably be coming, more of them will be coming, given the, the onset of the, of the winter. How are pe people feeling about that in Germany, the fact that so much money is being sent there and the, the fact that so many Ukrainians are, are coming to seek shelter here in Germany. I would say that Germany has definitely learned a lot of lessons from the crisis that we saw in 2015 when suddenly there were um, about a million people coming from Syria into Germany and we all remember the chaotic conditions that people were facing then and uh, German bureaucracy has done its job in a sense. Many people are saying we do have better structures in place so the population in general is still very much in support of helping people who are Ukraine also because everybody knows that they just need a temporary shelter you have to be honest about this people are expecting many of the Ukrainian families to go back as soon as they can which is also why one of the strategies of the current German government is to help Ukraine rebuild itself and to help um, Ukraine when it comes to rebuilding energy infrastructure so that Ukraine can stay a livable place Nina, I'm going to interrupt you there because we believe that Olaf Scholz is about to start speaking. We'll come back to you, Nina, in just a short while. Madam Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Merz, when I listened to you just now, I had to think of Alice in Wonderland. What is great, you talk it down and vice versa. What's really happened and who's responsible, all of that is becoming blurred and what seems logical is actually nothing but rubbish. One year ago, our energy storage systems were as empty as never before. Today, they're full to capacity. Because this government doesn't just talk, it acts. And because in the spring, fortunately, we didn't follow your suggestion of almost overnight switching off all gas supplies from Russia. What we did instead was gradually end German dependence on gas and coal. One year ago, our gas dependence was 50 percent. At the same time, this government, fast as never before in our country, made sure that we did have an alternative. In a few weeks' time in northern Germany, the first uh, LNG terminals will start operation. We've got our coal-fired power plants back from the reserve. The three remaining nuclear power plants will continue running until next spring. And the most important reform of the energy sector in decades was launched by us. This government makes sure that renewable energies and the necessary transmission grids are all built much faster than ever before. And by the way, also in the southern part of our country. It is this government that brings our country up to where we should be at this time and age when it comes to defence with capable armed forces. After CDU, CSU, defence ministers spent many years neglecting our armed forces. 
and the special assets set aside for the German armed forces, which we created, will enable us to have a proper, orderly change of direction. We want and we will spend 2% of our economy for the armed forces, but we want to make sure that the plants and the equipment that we need for all that will be new is first started, that we order what is right, and that we make sure that the armed forces are equipped in such a way that what they have will work for decades. That's what's linked to this special asset fund. It's a long-term plan rather than fast PR slogans. The armed forces deserve us to take due care and to make sure that all the problems that we now deal with are actually solved, because we find that it's not enough to say, well, we need more ammo, because the plants that produce this munition is no longer operational. So it's not enough to say we want a bit more of this particular device because it hasn't been produced for some time now. What we decide has to also make sure that we can live up to any challenging situation, and that's what we are going to do with these special assets. It was this government which went counter to decades of practice and decided to support Ukraine with the very weapons they need in their brave struggle every day. And we stick to that, standing shoulder to shoulder with our closest allies, and we will do so as long as this horrible, dreadful and criminal war will last. Russia has to stop waging this war. And for that, it was very important that the G20 summit on Bali send out a strong signal towards Moscow. And another thing was something which all the G20 members noted, namely any nuclear threat is totally unacceptable for every one of us. Accepting the use of these weapons is not for us. And as the chair of the G7, I already held to the same opinion. And I'm very glad that this is a red line and that on Bali we made it clear again. The Chinese leadership also publicly affirmed this opinion for the very first time when I visited Beijing three weeks ago. Just for that reason, the open exchange with President Xi was worth it. Just for that reason, the whole trip which you, Mr. Merz, used to polemicize without thinking in advance. This trip has been worth it. And this government also acts within the framework of the European Union. Ukraine, Moldova and in the future also Georgia have been opened the opportunity to join the European Union. For many years the West Balkan states have been meandering in a void when it came to the accession process. We've given it new momentum. Talking of these things, it's actually this government which has a clear idea and put that into words as far as the future as Europe is concerned, something which the French president and others had to wait years to hear. President Macron and I agree on having a Europe which is a geopolitical entity and capable to take action. In Prague, I made concrete proposals on that, and we are working on those with our partners. One of these proposals being the missile defense system that Germany has proposed. Only last week, with France and Spain, we managed to achieve something which is important for the strategic sovereignty of Germany. We were able to cut through a Gordian knot on that. The FK system is going to be uh, initiated after for many years that project did not have the necessary political attention in Berlin that it should have had. At the same time, there is a substantial German part in the development of the technology as well as the added value to gen be generated from it. That's the policy of this government. We bring Europe together, and that is to the benefit of our country.
And zugleich investiert diese Bundesregierung At the same mit time, this government is investing in a modern infrastructure, in digitization. So Germany is no longer the country of bridges that don't work, trains that are late, and mano covers that provide a bumpy ride. And that's what we did this summer with a nine euro public transport ticket. We were a clean sweep new broom for public transport. And now, with the digital Germany ticket, uh, one billion more funds for regionalization, we make sure we will have a long-term attractive public municipal transport in this country. It is this government that reforms the immigration laws, and we also make sure that we have better skilling, upskilling, reskilling opportunities for those living in this country. So gradually, we try to close the gap of the lack of skilled labor, which is something which is a legacy problem. This government will deal with all these things which were left behind, despite the Ukraine war, despite the pandemic, the energy crisis the supply chain problems and global inflation. In the first 11 months of uh, our government, we have initiated almost 11 acts of parliament, including some of the biggest relief packages for the citizens that our country has seen in its own history. And that includes a law on balancing the inflation effects, which means that 48 million people will pay far less in taxes. But you, uh, you vote against that. We actually implement relief. And then I hear that you, Mr. Merz, stand there at your party conference and you actually say it wasn't the last 16 years of the CDU-led government which caused the problems. No, it was the last 16 weeks under our new coalition government. All I can say is, if you believe that, you believe that... Uh, they have talking white rabbits as well. This is Alice in Wonderland. So welcome to the wonderland of the CDU-CSU where reality has been turned on its head. Reality is that this government in 12 months has actually done more, implemented more, sought it more than was possible in the last 12 years of the previous government. And that's because we are a government of action and we started to make progress in this country. But what makes up, uh, sets us apart, Mr. Merz, is clearly the idea we have of our citizens. In the previous days, we discussed intensively about the basic income support, Bürgergeld to citizens' income, and I'm glad that we found an agreement, a good solution. But there is one thing I would like to uh, mention. What we are now turning into law is nothing other than what, at the time, with the support of the now opposition, we rightly introduced during the COVID pandemic. That was a time when many people employed, self-employed, suddenly depending on state assistance, although they never have dreamt they would have to do this. Otherwise, they would have lost their apartments. We couldn't take away all their assets or their housing. It was something which at the time we all understood. And it's that same idea of justice which guides the reforms we are now going to agree on. 20 years ago, and, uh, the labor market reforms were implemented. At the time, we didn't have uh, work for all the people who need it work. Now we're lacking qualified, skilled labor. That's why we need skilling options, training, less bureaucracy. These are very important and integral parts of our reform. It's about finding ways out of long-term unemployment, away from jobs which are just auxiliary jobs and not a job in the proper labor market, which we want to help people find again. When I talk to citizens, for example, in the dialogues I hold in Magdeburg, Essen, Lübeck, Gifhorn, to name but a few, there are many people 
aren't just worried about the higher prices for energy and food, they are concerned about their jobs or the future of their company. And this makes one thing very clear. People want to work and they want to be able to live a decent life on the basis of their working income. And that is why those who get to it, keep things running, the ones that get up in the morning and start to work, these are the people that we focus on in our political agenda. And that's why it was so important for us to raise the national minimum wage to 12 euros. 600 million people will get more wage, more salary, and a greater appreciation for the hard work they're doing. Even a higher minimum wage in the nursing care sector, paying people who are looking after our old age citizens, that is something which will improve working conditions there. And this affects one of the most important and most hard hit job sections in our country. All those who earn less than 2,000 euros a month will pay less in social benefits and contributions from next year. Anybody who's earned about 1,100 euros will end up with 50 euros more in their purse every month. That is particularly important for people in part-time work, single parents, but also for a cashier in a supermarket or somebody who works at the dry cleaners. It's important we do that now. Just raising child rearing allowance to 250 euros a child across the board will mean that a kid, a family with two kids will have 750 euros more from next year on. The special child allowance for people with a smaller working income will be up to 3,000 euros a year per child. This is the way we deliver on our promise that in our prosperous country, not a single child will have to grow up in poverty. Two weeks ago, we introduced the largest housing allowance reform in this country, which will raise the number of people entitled to receive this allowance to 2 million from 1st of January next year, which will mean they have a few hundred euros more to spend every month, and that will benefit particularly those who work hard and yet don't manage to get more than the minimum wage or have a very, very small pension. This is the way we get people out of a basic income support if they've worked hard for all their lives. Honourable colleagues, we are the ones who make sure that work is worth more than it was at any time of this CDU-led German government. And we do so by helping the situation for those who work hard and earn little. This is in the interest of those who want to work. It's in the interest of the companies that are desperate for labour. And it's also in the interest of our own country that in these difficult times in particular, we need more cohesion and less division. Ladies and gentlemen, standing together is also an important feature when we try to support those who may have a decent income, but to also get into trouble because of the price rise. Pension contributions can be offset against tax entirely. That will be a major impact in the next, in the next two years. And there is one more thing we've achieved. As part of the concerted action which we initiated, employers and unions have paved the ground for one of payments of up to 3,000 euros a year in addition to the collective bargaining price rises. And I think this is evidence for the responsibility shown by the social partners in Germany. And that's an instrument we make use of. Only last week in the metal workers and, and electronic and electric industry, they agreed on a special one-off payment of 3,000 euros between unions and employers. And in many other sectors, they provide an energy or inflation bonus. The banks, uh, the car manufacturers, chemical industry, paper and pulp industry, iron and steel industry, they do the same thing. And that's a major progress benefiting many of our people going to work every single day. Two weeks ago, we 
decided on a law to balance inflation. It's an Inflation Compensation Act, which will provide relief for many taxpayers. 2023, we're talking about 90 million tax relief, uh, 32 million taxes less in the coming year. That includes the compensating for co-progression. It also means a very noticeable uh, increase of the tax-exempt allowance of child-rearing allowance of child pay. These are all reforms that we initiated. And this is a clear rejection of a creeping tax hike, and the biggest tax hike that it has happened because of the largest co-progression that Germany had ever seen in the past. So our message to the citizens is this government makes sure that it's worth performing well and that Germany and German citizens can emerge from this crisis strongly under their own steam. A crisis that today we can say our country can master it. I mentioned the uh, gas storage tanks which are full, the new liquid gas, the co-fat power plants which we keep uh, operating, the nuclear power plants which will keep running. All of that means that for this winter Germany will have security of supply. And we have that because the Germany has been, German government has been bold in redirecting our energies and because households all over the country have been saving energy. And that will remain important, particularly with a view to the coming year and the coming winter in 2023. I would like to say thank you to our citizens already. Thank you for looking ahead. Thank you for acting together. The energy price hike is not something we can completely compensate for or reduce, but we are reducing it to an acceptable level. The reduction of turnover tax for distance heating and gas heating from 9 to 7% has already been agreed on. Taking over the advance payment December for gas and heating will also come. After intensive deliberations, including with the European Union and the energy providers, the framework has been agreed for the gas and um, electricity price ceiling for households and companies. I don't need to tell you more. You can read it in the press today. That will come into force for the first in March. It will be paid out and therefore not just be a relief for the month of March, but also retroactively for the month of January and February. Many gas consumers have received letters from their gas providers or their landlords uh, having a 20, 30, sometimes 40 percent price rise per kilowatt hour. In the past, it was something like seven or eight cents. 18 percent of the prior year's consumption is going to be capped by 12 cents per kilowatt hour. For many people, this still means additional costs, but these additional costs are far below the prices now announced by the energy providers. The prices, even with this uh, reduced increase are difficult for those to keep to deal with who have a problem. That's why we have a hardship case fund from the stabilization fund. 12 billion euros in total will be provided. Regarding the costs for electricity, gas and heating, the price caps will mean we end up more or less at the level where experts uh, see the prices for 2024. By that time, we'll have more liquid gas terminals and then the accelerated uh, use of renewable energy will also have a significant impact. And that's why it's important that, yes, as a one-off, we really uh, spend the 200 billion euro huge sum in order to deal with that because there are, without the loss of hundreds of thousands of works, without the loss of the problems that people will face, we will survive on the basis of that investment. Our country has the strength to master that crisis, emerge strengthened from it. And we mobilize all that power with our economic stabilization fund and the relief packages, which we've already been uh, passing gradually over the past few months. I would like to thank the finance minister and the minister of economic affairs and the whole of the coalition government for supporting us on this course which will steer Germany safely through turbulent waters.
The next years will be decisive to strengthen Germany and Europe, to make us fit for the big change with climate change, digitization, securing our prosperity, social cohesion and demographic change. Together we feel we are obliged to accept progress. We are united by seeing the opportunities in these changes. We have a first exploratory paper for new laws. That was where we agreed on our joint objectives when the new coalition government started. At the beginning, there was a joint commitment made by all three coalition partners in favor of progress of a new dawn of taking actions for the future of this country. And that is the spirit with which we started our work, and that is the spirit which keeps carrying us forward. Because when this watershed, this turning of the times, and Mr. Merz, thank you very much for referring to my speech. If that moment the global crisis taught us one thing, then that's that we need change. Business as usual is not an option. I actually looked at you on purpose because the business as usual party is now on the opposition benches and that's where they should be. And so it is a good thing that in this day and age our country has a government that wants to do more than business as usual. We have made clear from the beginning that the future of our energy supply uh, is part and parcel of renewable energies, green uh, hydrogen. So we become not just independent of unreliable supplies like Russia, we also protect the climate and we manage to reduce energy costs to an acceptable level. That's why we use this year to pass important laws, laws that we will need in order to extend renewables and to extend the grid and transmission networks. And we know before a big climate conference at the beginning of a new government for uh, saving greenhouse gases, extending renewables, ambitious goals are usually set and usually these are beautiful words and nothing happens, but the steps to reach that were never actually implemented in concrete form. That is something we have changed. Our objective by 2030, 80% of our energy should come from renewable energy is accompanied with a very clear idea of how to extend this. For example, with the tender volumes for onshore wind parks or photovoltaics, we will increase almost double that. The extension of renewable energy is now something which will be given priority in administrative decision and accelerated planning procedures. This has been enshrined in law. 2% of the territory of the country will be available for wind power in the future. In order to achieve greater acceptance of these for the citizens, new ways of, participate, of participation has been, uh, have been achieved and better economic involvement as well. Just by introduce, uh, reducing the renewable energy level, we not only reduced energy costs, we also help to uh, de-bureaucratize energy, which was more than necessary. Many companies in the solar and, and wind sector have suffered in recent years, not just on the, because of COVID, but also because of bureaucracy and because the way ahead wasn't clear. But now there is clear progress. In the first half of 2020, uh, power generation from wind power has increased by 18% versus the prior year. Looking at offshore wind power, since mid-2020, nothing had been happening until in the summer for the first time we started operating new wind power plants and mobile follow. As far as transport is concerned, direction. But of course, in order to achieve this huge transformation in industry, transport, construction and housing, we need more than just the right political framework. We need um, the people doing the work, we need the companies, we need the technology, we need the, the skilled people that build the wind turbines and install the new systems in housing.
That's why we promote upskilling and reskilling. That's why we make sure that our politics, unions, companies, civil society are all brought together on a regular basis for discussions. In concrete terms, the next time our alliance will meet in February, we will decide how can we develop those technologies and have them spread all over the country that are needed for this transformation, particularly the feed of hydrogen. These are questions which are essential, and they are essential for two reasons. One, because the emerging nations in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, they will only also join climate protection on an international scale if their people don't suffer unduly from that. My discussions at the Sharm el Sheikh Climate Conference made that very clear. But in order to do that, we need technologies that allow a climate neutral growth. On the other hand, this is where there is a huge opportunity for German industry. Our um, machine plant equipment builders, car makers, they're the ones who have the innovative power, who have their R&D capacity that can create and supply the necessary technology. All over the world, there is a huge demand for that, even now. So that will open up new market opportunities if, by 2045, Germany will be one of the first climate-neutral industrial nations. And that's exactly what we aim to achieve, and we will make it. Honourable colleagues, the price of doing nothing will be incomparably high. So the deficits of energy and trade policy, which led to unilateral dependence on, in particular, Russia and China, that's something we are stopping. And after years of neglect, we now want to achieve a modern, a strong, armed forces, which is capable of defending the country. So the many years of deficits in a backward-looking transport policy and deficits in digitization of our country are matters we are now tackling. And this is why we act against the lack of skilled labor. And after years of blockading these matters, we create a new immigration law, which is state of the art. And we recognize that housing construction is a central social question which can't be dealt with as an also ran in one of the ministries. So the many people who have put the brake on energy and climate change for many years need to be overcome. But above all, what we do is we need to keep the country together. We won't leave anybody behind. Our citizens know very well that we want work, we want progress, cohesion, standing together, focusing on what really matters. And that's what this government stands for. And you in particular, Mr. Merz, and your colleagues, you are cordially invited. Work with us on this big job of making our country fit for the future in a world which sees profound changes. We should be fit for the crisis, fit for the winter, where we are that. But we need energy and resolutions from every citizen. And we will have that thanks to the work of this government. You have been listening to Chancellor Scholz addressing the German parliament there about his government's spending plans for the coming year. He positioned his government as a government of action. He talked about a new dawn of taking action in Germany, spoke about uh, Germany's involvement in Ukraine, in the EU, dialogue with China, but focused a lot also on the support it was offering its citizens from raising the national minimum wage to creating a modern and accessible transport system and, of course, a big focus on helping people pay their energy bills, which is a huge issue in Germany right now. And DW's chief political correspondent, Nina Harder, is at the German Bundestag listening to the Chancellor speaking. Nina, what are your main takeaways from what the Chancellor just said? 
Well, yeah, you've essentially mentioned all the important talking points. What I always find interesting in these situations is that Olaf Scholz is not considered to be a very good public speaker, so he does go into detail quite a bit, and he does sort of uh, sum up all his results, all the progress that has been made, and he does really challenge his listeners to pay attention. What his key message was, of course, was we've got things under control, but we do have to now work really, really hard. One of the key takeaways for me, for example, was that uh, the whole topic of the climate crisis was mentioned way at the back of his speech. So he focused a lot on all the other aspects that Germany is now currently struggling with. He blamed the previous governments, especially when it comes to the neglect that they, show, uh, that they showed the German armed forces, but also the um, infrastructure, so broken bridges, and uh, holes in the roads, etc. So he, he did say, we do have to clean up this mess that you left us. And then add to that the, the other big shock, of course, Russia's invasion on Ukraine. So we are faced with a lot of challenges, but we are working hard. He stressed the fact that his government has passed 100 laws in the first 11 months of their tenure. So this is uh, something where he wanted to show just how busy they've been. And uh, when it comes to the topic of the climate crisis, Crisis, he does see that very much as something where the German economy has to focus if they don't want to essentially lose the competition with other players worldwide. So he, he always stresses this fact that this is something where the German industry has to go into renewable energies if Germany wants to stay a big global player. You're absolutely right. He gets really passionate in, in these debates, doesn't he? And he really went for the criticism um, of the, the opposition leader, Friedrich Merz. I mean, he described him as living in an Alice in Wonderland uh, fairy, fairyland. These um, budget debates, they're traditionally an, uh, an opportunity for the, for the opposition to, to attack the German chancellor. Who do you think won in this debate? I would have to say Olaf Scholz. I mean, essentially, he did say to Friedrich Merz, look, you're criticizing us of things where you then had to later agree that we were right from the start. And it's true that, uh, for example, Friedrich Merz did criticize Olaf Scholz's planned trip to China very, very strongly. And uh, later on, uh, Olaf Scholz got the Chinese president uh, to speak out against new the use of nuclear weapons. And that is is something where the international community has said this trip was successful. So Germany got the support from France and said you were right to travel there to extract that message from the Chinese president. So this is something where Olaf Scholz definitely scored a point. Um, other than that, rhetorically, I would say you do have to pay very, very close attention if you want to follow Olaf Scholz. He uses a lot of pop culture references. So this speech was very much about the topic of uh, the opposition living in Alice in Wonderland, in believing in speaking white rabbits. So this is something where you, you do sometimes think, does he go too far? Does that clash with his public image as somebody who does sit at his desk and does the hard work? But uh, this is something where he says, OK, eventually people will understand who I am and that I am delivering results, so I will get away with this. He did talk a lot about the huge amount of money that is being spent by the government. You talked about uh, climate change, um, modernising the armed forces, investing in infrastructure. Now, we know that the German budget is uh, expected to, to, to be passed on, on Friday. Um, what are the priorities going forward in the coming year? I mean, is it, has it basically been summed up by what uh, Scholz was saying uh, today? But Olaf Scholz, I think, is asking the German public for a bit of patience because not everything is going to be realized overnight, he said. And, uh, for example, he still stressed the fact that Germany wants to stick to the 2% defense budget plan. He said this is something that we want to achieve, but at the moment it doesn't really make sense to just throw money into ammunition that then is used for vehicles that are no longer being... Um, 
being manufactured. So this is something he says where we need to invest in the machines that produce those weapons first, and then we can increase the spending for the ammunition. So this is not going to be fulfilled, but he said he wants to stick to this, uh, to this plan, and definitely the defense topic is going to be one of the key ones. Also, when it comes to Germany's role, many people are saying, why don't you take more of a lead? There, has, there was a big debate about the weapons deliveries to Ukraine, and that will continue as the war in Ukraine is continuing. But also, uh, I've already said that, Olaf Scholz says the previous governments left us a big mess when it comes to neglecting crucial fields where we just are in a position where we have to now establish proper um, minimum standards again. We can't accept the fact that we've got broken bridges in this country. We also had a huge dependence on Russian energy supplies, so we are looking for alternatives. At the same time, we are going to have to invest in um, expanding renewable energies and build more wind power farms, etc. So these are probably going to stay the main topics at the same time as having to make sure that people can get by on their jobs, living off their wages. Also, when it comes to the unclear situation of energy supply over this winter, this is going to be something that is also going to dominate the next few months. Nina, thank you. That's DW's chief political correspondent, Nina Haase, reporting from the Bundestag. Now, at least one person has died and 14 people have been injured following explosions at two bus stations in the city of Jerusalem. Israel's security minister has said the explosions were attacks, although the full details are still unclear. Doctors were treating at least one person who is in a critical condition. Um, the two